started out with California state fossil, uh, this saber-toothed cat, Smilodon fatalis, and I studied direwolves as well, and since then I've branched out to um, smaller animals that we still have today, like bobcats and skunks and gray foxes and all those cute, charismatic things. So, I'm happy to be here. And, uh, Myrene, what is your favorite prehistoric-inspired movie? Well, I'm biased, but I think it has to be Ice Age because, <laughs> you know, everyone's like, oh, you study Diego. And I'm like, yeah, I do, actually. Uh, I'm Dr. Michael Habib. I'm an associate professor of medicine at UCLA. Uh, but I am also a paleontologist, despite being a professor of medicine. Uh, there are a couple, a couple of ways that those interact, uh, one of them being by anatomy. Uh, so I am an anatomist. I'm also a freelance artist and consultant. So while I do a good bit of work, particularly on animal flight in the fossil record, uh, pterosaurs, early birds, things of that, uh, that, that sort, I also uh, spend a good, a good bit of time consulting with and working with a range of outstanding concept artists which is one of the ways that I connect with this particular subject of paleontology and pop culture, using fossil animals and the principles derived from them to help design more compelling creatures. And so I'm, I'm very proud to work with folks at Lucasfilm, Pixar, Disney Feature Animation. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Chris Cortez, and I am an education programs manager at the Inland Empire Resource Conservation District. And like Mike here, um, I am still a paleontologist because they do interact. Conservation and paleontology do interact the way that, um, you know, if you, if you can't really fully understand what's going on right now if you're not looking at what's in the past. So that's how we're able to use paleontology and paleontological knowledge to kind of see how we can use it in conservation today. Excellent. And um, I didn't get your favorite prehistoric movies, so both of you could answer that. Mikey, go first. Well, I'm going to go with the obvious one, but maybe for a less than obvious reason. So the original Jurassic Park from 1993, um, that was very formative for me, but also I, I have to, to mention it, I think, dear to my heart, because my PhD supervisor consulted on the film. <laughs> Um, my favorite movie is, uh, Land Before Time. Wow. Like, yeah, yeah, see? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> my name's Adam Hottenlocker. I'm a, uh, professor of anatomy at University of Southern California. And, uh, I think when I was young, I really, uh, I think Land Before Time really, like, got me into paleontology. Land Before Time and, uh, obviously the first Jurassic Park movie. But, um, I, uh... Uh, got a master's at Cal State San Bernardino and uh, my PhD at the University of Washington and uh, do a lot of field work in the southwest United States, uh, in Africa, I've done some work in Antarctica, and uh, my research focuses on the evolutionary transitions from early reptiles to mammals. I'm Nate Smith, I'm a curator of the Dinosaur Institute here at the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County. Uh, I've been a curator here since 2015. Before that, I was a professor of uh, biology at Howard University and did my PhD at University of Chicago in the Field Museum. And I primarily study early dinosaur evolution, like Triassic, Jurassic dinosaurs and, and their relatives in places like New Mexico, Arizona, and further afield in Argentina and Antarctica. And favorite movie is going to be a deep cut. That's going to be the 1958 Monster on Campus. If anybody wants to check it out, <laughs> some of you already know. Hi, I'm Becky. Hi, I'm Becky Wu. Uh, I'm the uh, postdoctoral researcher in the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County. Uh, I study the tooth replacement in Mesozoic birds and their close relatives, including like other archosaurs. Um, my favorite paleontology inspired movie is the Jurassic Park, because, you know, who doesn't? <laughs> <laughs> Hi everyone, uh, my name is Kirsten Formoso. I am a PhD candidate at the University of Southern California and a graduate student in residence at the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County. I study the evolution of how animals went from walking on land to swimming in the ocean. So well-known animals alive today like whales, seals, manatees, and a lot of extinct cool animals like uh, marine reptiles like mosasaurs, plesiosaurs, and ichthyosaurs. My favorite prehistoric inspired movie 
Oh my gosh, it's actually really hard. I would say it's probably a tie between Disney's Dinosaur, uh, for nostalgia reasons, and I, I like the second Jurassic Park. I love the two T-Rexes and Ian Malcolm a lot. <laughs> <laughs> All right, excellent. So you can see we have a variety of backgrounds here, so that's excellent. I forgot to mention that I specifically study Parasaurolophus, and I have its brain in my backpack, so if anybody wants to see that, it's an endocast for now. But if you want to see it, let me know, and I will gladly show it to you. All right, so paleontologist, but what is paleontology? Does anybody want to answer what paleontology is? <laughs> I will take this one. Okay. All right. Paleontology is going to be the study of fossils, and fossils are going to be any evidence of past life. That's going to include body fossils, like bones, the famous fossils that you see on display museums, but also um, other fossils, like trace fossils, which include dinosaur footprints and impressions that life is there, and even chemical fossils that are chemical traces of past molecules that were made by life in, that you can measure um, with chemical methods in the air. So that's paleontology. Anybody want to add to that before we move on? Yeah, I can add to it. Um, yeah, so in addition to fossils, I think that uh, especially with some really cutting edge methods these days, you know, the study of ancient DNA, I think people would also consider that paleontology. And um, ancient DNA can be preserved in fossils, but, you know, um, DNA itself might be argued to be not a fossil. Um, also, like the study of paleo environments, right? So um, things like sediments. So these are sediments, these can be sediments um, from billions of years ago. So even though those are not, those sediments are not by fossil, like, they can be, uh, still be included in the study of paleontology. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. John Hammond. <laughs> Excellent. Right on the line. We spared no expense. <laughs> All right, so the next question. Um, no, I'm sorry. Okay, so <laughs> why do you think the ancient past is so intriguing and inspiring? Um, I'll take this one. Uh, for me, it's because time. I don't think that people really understand how deep time works. I don't think that I even understood how deep time works. I mean, even your language in the question, right? You said ancient. You can relate to ancient. You think about ancient, and you're like, oh, really old. But in paleontology, you study just how old. <laughs> and when you think about it, when you put 4.6 billion years into perspective, I think that that's just so mysterious that it's very captivating. And I think for all of us, it's, it's like a drug, right? You just need to know more. You're like, wait, but what happened during this time? So for me, that's what it is. Anybody else? I was gonna say, I think it's very humbling uh, when you look at the vast scale of time and our place on this planet. And I just love kind of understanding how past ecosystems feed into the modern one, like our modern ecosystem is what we know, what we're familiar with, but it's just really cool to think of how it got here, how it's different, how it's similar even to these deeply, vastly ancient environments and ecosystems. And it's just, we're such a tiny little uh, speck in time, and, and it's really cool to have the privilege to be able to actually touch and hold and do uh, scientific research on the, on the evidence of the past. Uh, you know, one of the things that's really cool about paleontology, especially like, you know, as an anatomist and, you know, someone who studies, like, you know, biophysics, you know, we have all these ideas of, you know, what are the extremes of what biology can do, you know, what can animals do, um, what can humans do, and one of the great things about paleontology is the way it surprises us, the way we can look for fossils and find animals that sort of push the limits of body size, it's like, you know, I, I just think you know, we can have ideas of how animals should act and how they should behave. And then we can show the fossils and say, hey, look, this is what they did. This is, this is surprising and, and amazing. Yeah, you can definitely tell stories, which is pretty amazing. Deep time is really hard to wrap your mind around. You're right, like still, even as paleontologists, it's like still hard to wrap your mind around. The story of extremes. Yes, yeah. definitely. Anybody else want to add? Um, oh, there's a quick. Oh, sorry. Oh. Go ahead. <laughs> As a, there's a quip I use from time to time, but it's true, which is that as a paleontologist, as, a paleontologist, or as paleontologists, plural here today, uh, we have uh, most of the organisms. Uh, actually, about 99.9% .9 of them. So I think one of the things that's particularly fascinating about it, drew me into paleontology, was just the fact that 
there's this sudden moment where you realize that what we live alongside what's familiar is such an incredibly small fraction of what has existed or what can exist to Dr. Lantra's point. So, um, and we'll pass it back. Uh, yeah, so for me, like the most interesting thing is to know the whole picture of the evolution. So, um, and also the Earth's history, like you cannot look into the Earth's history without looking into paleontology. And that's also echoing the deep, deep time part, because we, we are also looking at the evolution that's happening nowadays. But human history is way too short to see the whole picture and to see like how the Earth evolving with the you know, with the organism that's living on that, like going through this long time. Yeah, paleontology can provide our context and our bigger sample size. So like, anybody out there take a Geology 101 class? Any hands up there? Okay, so you've probably all heard like the old <laughs> adage, the, the present is the key to the past, right? That kind of thing. Well, the flip side is true as well, right? The past is key to the present. And a lot of the work of paleontology these days, in the recent decades, has been as a context for understanding modern biological response to climate change and other things. And, and so paleontology is kind of going through a renaissance right now of being more relevant to the rest of the sciences. Excellent. Thank you so much. All right, so now we're going to go ahead and we're going to take a close look at some ways that paleontology has inspired pop culture. And we're starting with Jurassic Park, of course. All right, so dinosaurs and feathers. <laughs> Let's get some thoughts on this. Uh, feathers or no feathers? What, do you, what are your thoughts? Well, evidence shows there's feathers. So. <laughs> Let's go with the evidence. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, this, this is one that <clears throat> it's, well, it's near and dear to my heart because it's a lot of what I work on is uh, the, the, the branch of dinosaurs that, that were, for the most part, feathered animals. Um, this is one of those things where it's, it's, uh, it, it, to, to Becky's point, it's, it's not uh, even, um, uh, it, it, it's not circumstantial evidence, it's direct evidence. It is, in fact, this is, it was close to provable as you get in anything that is in mathematics. Um, they died and became fossilized and things that fossilized of their bodies include bones, skin, and feathers, a bunch of them, so those clearly had. Uh, had feathers. The tricky part, uh, and I'll, I'll pitch it to my fellow panelists that may pitch in a little bit more about this. The tricky part is figuring out exactly uh, what that life experience, uh, life appearance, excuse me, would have looked like, uh, how feathered they would be, and also exactly how far across the dinosaur tree of life feathers would be present. Because one of the things that we can derive from the ones that preserved with feathers is that their close relatives probably also had feathers, even if none of those fossils have happened to preserve with it. Because usually you only get the skeleton, you do not typically get the skin or, or other coverings. Uh, and that is a, that's a little bit more detective work. So if the question is just feathers, the answer is yes. If the question is which, the answer is ooh. <laughs> so with, going, going you know, forward with the feather question, um, we knew that dinosaurs had feathers when they made Jurassic Park. Why do you think they left those out? Why do you think people... No. So the first feathered dinosaur actually being published in 1996. The first Jurassic movie was coming out before that. Uh, okay. So when they're making the movie, they definitely didn't know. <laughs> so I guess later on when they made more Jurassic Park movies, when we knew they had feathers, or if the... Why do you think people are not really liking the feather idea is the question. Well, I don't think people, sorry, I don't think people doesn't like the feather idea. Um, well, I the guess, guy that manages the CGI budget. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Probably, yes. Yeah, but um, like for a later part of the franchise, like in the Jurassic World, especially the new one, they definitely put the feathers in there. Um, although, like, like Mike pointed out, like what kind of feather and what kind of a dinosaur, that is the question. But um, yeah, they definitely put the feathers in there, and, and I think they look great. Yeah, and Dominion, uh, Jurassic World Dominion finally got on the feathered raptor train, which is really nice. I do think the reason why they didn't go with it for like the more iconic raptors is, of course, they were the iconic ones, the kitchen scene raptors, and when they rebooted those 
Raptors in Jurassic World, I think they thought that coming back after, you know, the Jurassic Park franchise went on a hiatus might have been jarring to people to be like, oh, these Raptors suddenly have feathers on it. And so it took the third movie in the franchise to actually show a nicely feathered dromaeosaur. And I don't It'd think be it's... like having three different actors play the whole. Right? Yes, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, totally. I don't think it's like so malicious, like, uh, you know, this is for the, the pro only dinosaurs. It's just a matter of practicalness and like, yeah. And also, may I add in, uh, when the first feather dinosaur, the, um, the uh, what's it called, Sinolosaur Raptor, right, uh, was published, it was actually quite controversial because people are like arguing, is this real, really feather? This like first feather dinosaur, you can imagine, is this controversial to the, the kind of academic society as well. So, you know, it has to take a little time to settle down and then like people are more accepting of the you know feather dinosaur idea. I think people nowadays pretty much know that, you know, it's it's comprehensive. Yeah. Yeah. It is becoming more public knowledge. It, it's worth noting as well that if you're in when you're in the room, so to speak, um, on say the uh, on an animation sequence or a, a CGI sequence that's being built, the way that the crew talks about these creatures as his characters, and so very much to uh, uh, to Nate's point, the uh, the chain once you had established the look in the original film, changing the look for them meant fundamentally changing the look of a character. And for us, we might be thinking, well, that's updating an animal with paleontological evidence, but that's not how the film crew is thinking about it. That, to them, that'd be like, hey, what if we completely change the costume for Captain America? You could, and you could, and you did, but you need to actually work up to it and have a justification for it. You can't just do it without saying anything about it because it's considered to be a big change. So you have to, so that's actually a thing. And yeah, they did. Um, but they, they, they drew attention to it, so they have to lean into it. If they're not going to lean into it, they're not going to do it. All right. So now we're going to go ahead and move on. So the next topic I want to ask about is de-extinction. Um, is this possible? Does ancient DNA actually exist? And what about for Ice Age mammals? Um, what about the ethics for de-extinction? Anybody can take it. <laughs> uh, I, I could take part of this, I guess, because I do work in conservation, and that's kind of what we do. We, we conserve animals and, and ecosystems. Um, I think if we are going to go that route, we ne definitely need to look at functionality and species functionality within an ecosystem. And, <laughs> and depending on whether or not it's viable. Like, would we want to bring a, a whole ecosystem back? Because you're not just bringing back one organism, right? You'd have to bring back that whole uh, chain of events, I guess, <laughs> for lack of a better word. Um, so that's kind of what, what I think. But. I was weighing briefly on the practical aspect. Um, on a practical note, Part of the issue is that DNA doesn't have a particularly long, what we call half-life, okay, so it breaks down fairly rapidly. Um, and then that, that combines with another aspect of DNA to make it very, very difficult, which is that there's only four base pairs, right? So it's essentially a four-letter alphabet. Your DNA code basically works off a four-letter alphabet. Now, if you think about how long the words have to be if you only had four letters to work with in order to communicate it, and, and the answer, of course, is they have to be very, very long. So after it's broken down even just a little bit, it becomes very quickly meaningless. Um, it's very difficult to do anything with it. It's even degraded a little bit because you just you get a long, you get a, a chunk of sequence. You're like, well, this could be part of a gene for making claws, or it could be part of a gene for making the lens of the eye, or it could be a regulatory gene for insulin. They all have this chunk of thirty codes in a row. Um, so it becomes very meaningless very, very quickly, right. which means it pretty much has to be very, very recent. Thank you. So I know, Myreen, you've worked on this recently. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Sure, I can talk about it as an Ice Age paleontologist. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I think part of, part of your question was about Ice Age mammals, and uh, part of your question also was, is this possible? Um, I think that the technology, well, I learned recently um, by talking with uh, people in Australia, we're trying to uh, 
to revive, to resurrect the Tasmanian wolf or Tasmanian tiger. Do you all know which animal that is? So yeah, I was recently um, you know, in on another panel like this uh, with the scientists um, over there at the um, trying to revive the Tasmanian wolf. And yeah, the, the technology is farther along than I realized, than I think a lot of us realize. Um, so I think that it could happen in our lifetimes that we can bring back extinct species. Uh, now the issues become, you know, what do the species need and that's where, you know, what Crystal said comes in. If you bring back a mammoth or if you bring back a Tasmanian wolf, can you bring back the things that it used to eat, the other animals that it used to live with? the environments, the plants that it used to live along? And can you ensure that, you know, humans don't prey on the animal that you just brought back? Or that, you know, you have, and it's not just humans, right? It's also all the other side effects that we have caused throughout our history. So it's like, well, now Australia has all these other mammals that were not there. You know, like Australia was the land of marsupials and now there's a lot of non-marsupials there um, that might prey on your Tasmanian wolf that you just brought back, you know, things like that. So um, I think that it's it's incredibly exciting, but it's also, you know, there we have to talk about a lot of these issues that might come up that are not even, you know, I think that the science is possible, but then the question becomes, well, we can, but should we, right? I, I'm actually curious, where were they planning on doing that? Were they going to do like a small test area first or something? Yeah, I do think they are going to do a, t a small test area first, but the thing is the Tasmanian wolf was, you know, previously just on Tasmania. But of course they have fossils of it on mainland Australia as well, suggesting that its distribution was wider than even before the animal went extinct within, you know, human memory. So, yeah, I think that the eventual long-term plan is to help rewild the Australian mainland. But yeah, we can talk about mammoths as well and <laughs> other things closer to home. But. Oh, um, if I may add, so in the ethic uh, issue part, there is also a concern is that um, because these are animals are extinct, so even if we can like magically get genome through bioengineering or somehow and then put it into an egg, it still need a surrogate mother, and that will be another species of the you know, re close relative. In the case of the mammoth, the close relative will be Asian uh, elephant, but the size of the Asian elephant is much smaller than the mammoth. So whether or not it can hold the baby or the fetus throughout the whole pregnancy would be an issue, and that will go to the same with other species that we want to you know, resurrect or the extinction. Like, is this ethical to put the animal right to be sure? Yeah. Thank you. Yes, I want to comment on maybe the less sexy side of this equation as well. And, you know, when we talk about de extinction and bringing these things back, it's often dinosaurs or mammoths or saber toothed cats. Um, but at a smaller, kind of more um, modern scale, you can think of there are animals that have gone extinct in different regions all the time, and we're constantly trying to figure out how to reintroduce sapiens into Yellowstone or, or animals that have had their ranges shrunk over time. And this is just me to kind of fly the flag of paleontology is that the work that we all do sometimes weighs in on that. And you have cases where conservation biologists were concerned about maybe reintroducing the black footed ferret in this region because its current prey item isn't there. But the paleontologist said, oh, no, no, if you go back and look at the fossil record, they did just fine eating all these other little critters. So you can let them go loose there and they'll totally thrive. And so, you know, in, at a smaller scale, paleontology can kind of weigh in on these issues in terms of what are the practical ways that we might do these reintroductions. Thank you. Okay, so we kind of already went into the ice age here. Um, let's see if this moves. It's not moving. It's not moving. We'll just keep talking. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, Ice Age. Um, do you think that a poor portrayal of science affects science itself? And the next question for that uh, second part question. Let me see if I can get this to move now. Tech issues. Okay. 
So that? Okay. <laughs> now I need this little part too. <laughs> oh no. All right, you can go ahead and answer that part. Part of the question for Ice Age, at least. Does poor portrayal of science affect science itself? And any thoughts on the uh, movie, The Ice Age? Um, I'm going to take this one really, really quickly. Sorry, Maureen. Um, but actually, I just had this conversation with my husband last night. And um, it was because someone that he works with um, told him that the Earth is hollow. <laughs> Which is, uh, <laughs> I'll just leave it at that, I'm not, you know, um, but it, it makes it problematic, right? Like, I think it was like Ice Age 3 or 4 or something that uh, they ended up showing that the, the Earth was hollow and they had like this whole, like, dinosaurs were like living in the middle of the Earth. Um, and, but it makes it problematic for me because I'm like, how do I explain it? Like, no, that's just a movie. Like, I would think that no one would ever actually think that this is true, but at the end of the day, we do need to take into consideration that pulp culture does really affect everybody and, and everybody's views. So if they see something like that, they're probably going to go in and, and research it the wrong way and, and find evidence for it. And so it makes my job a lot harder when I'm trying to explain that this is not how it works. You know? Yeah, to, to add on that, you know, I used to be very light and whatever about it. like oh it's fine it's just fiction it's fantasy you know it takes aspects of real science which is cool and it does and i do still feel strongly that that is the case that it's okay that dinosaurs that we see in jurassic park um aren't totally accurate it's okay that the um animals in ice age are like just all cenozoic mammals living at the same time it seems there's like a mere ethereum in there mixed with like a mod like a much closer to us mammoth i digress but <laughs> there, there are issues when it comes to doing outreach and when people come with these preconceived uh, notions about what these animals were based on the movies. For example, the whole T-Rex's vision is based on movement. That's a really famous one that is just absolute bogus. T-Rex probably had terrifyingly good vision and do not stand still in front of one if you manage to go back in time and see it. So, But then of course it's a really quick conversation, right? Like I just told you all, like, actually T-Rex has great vision, that's not true. And that's fine, you can like do those little little corrections here and there, but we can't always reach everyone and there are some much more, you know, serious and, and you know, entrenched ones. Feathered dinosaurs is a really good example. Like, oh, I don't think dinosaurs have feathers. I've never seen feathered dinosaurs in my movies. Like, no, but they were there. So those are kind of more involved conversations that you have to address because of these films. Like, oh, you know, at the same time, I'm grateful to a lot of inaccurate portrayals. For example, like the Mosasaurus in Jurassic World, grossly oversized, had crocodile skin didn't have the tail fluke, whatever. It's a mosasaur, I can tell people like, oh, I study mosasaurs. Have you seen Jurassic World? And they say yes. And so it, it depends on the level of egregious uh, misadaptation of the science to what you're actually trying to achieve when you communicate. I know I've been asked plenty of times during outreach events uh, whether, when the Indominus Rex lived or Indominus Rex is their favorite dinosaur. For the little kids, I'm like, oh, that's sweet, but um, it's not a real dinosaur. But it's based off of real dinosaurs and real animals. But when the adults, <laughs> there's been some adults that are like, Indominus Rex is such a cool dinosaur, my favorite dinosaur. All right, um, anybody else want to add to uh, scientific accuracy in films? Yeah, so I think that it's not just, you know, the accuracy of, okay, so for me, uh, watching Ice Age, I was like, that is not a saber-toothed tiger, that's a cat, but, you know, that aside, because it's not, you know, anyway, we can talk about that later, but, <laughs> but also, it's, um, I think it's also poor portrayal of the scientific process, right, I think that um, scientists are, like, yeah, sure, they can be portrayed as evil, you know, as villains, uh, but, but even when they're good, I think they're very much portrayed in culture as like having all the answers or maybe coming up with the answer on their own. And this is something that's come up in an earlier panel today. Uh, but yeah, science is just, um, science in, you know, the scientific process can be very different from uh, what's portrayed in film. And I understand why it's portrayed sometimes the way it is because a lot of what we do, you know, we're not always swashbuckling all the time like we're not always like slashing through the jungle with machetes or whatever however uh, we do work collaboratively like we do um, 
you know, there is a, a process of discovery rather than just magically coming up with whatever finding we have. So that's something that I think, um, yeah, people who can be new to science uh, might gloss over from just pop culture, but something that's very valuable to, to portray. Yeah, I had a, an old advisor that had a great kind of uh, analogy to quote me about misconceptions of how science works. He says, you know, science isn't usually somebody sitting in a lab, coming in a lab, and all of a sudden going, aha! Like, it's not like, eureka! Most of the big discoveries in science come from working on something and then being like, ah, that's kind of weird. And then looking at the more from there. All right, so... Uh, we have party vibes in here now. <laughs> okay, so we're going to go ahead and move on to the next. Um, we have a show that most people will probably be familiar with, Game of Thrones. Um, and, and how, for Game of Thrones questions, how do we use science to make fiction more believable? And what are your thoughts on the dragons and dire wolves in Game of Thrones? Hey, uh, so Kirsten's pointing at me because... <laughs> She knows a thing. Um, <laughs> any case, so some math I worked out some years ago may or may not have something to do with how the Game of Thrones dragons work. Um, any case, uh, so we'll, uh, I'll, I'll just pitch in on that. So uh, one thing that I've ended up doing quite a bit of actually over the years for a number of different kinds of shows and programs and stuff is making big things fly because I've worked a lot on very large things that did fly, not as big as Game of Thrones dragons, but uh, the large pterosaurs, and worked out, among other things, and this is kind of the lesson you get from paleontology, is the rules underlying that. So there's the you know, initial observation, but then there are just sort of, well, how does this work in terms of the physics and the inter interaction of physics and biology and using the fossil record to help inform that understanding. And that's a lot of what I, for example, do, and uh, Others up here have done that kind of work as well, can weigh in as, uh, also. But one of the things that, that was very directly applied in this case is the rules of how fast wings go and how hard something has to jump in order to take off and those sorts of things and the timing um, of flying animals as they get bigger and bigger and bigger. Now, of course, they pushed it beyond what physics, at least our physics, non-magical physics would allow in terms of the size. Um, but they did do the actual speed correctly. In other words, if they were made out of magically strong muscle and magically strong bone, that's about how fast the wings would go, and that's about how fast they would take off, and that's about how fast they would do everything at the probably 150 tons or something that, that uh, Drogon is. Um, and so that's something where the, the, the study of paleontology actually laid out the math. All right, thank you. Anybody else want to weigh in on dragons and dire wolves and Game of Thrones and scientific? So, I, so obviously House of the Dragon, which is the superior show, uh, just finished season one. <laughs> <She's fine. laughs> yes, yes. And, and so what I really liked about House of the Dragon is that it showed diversity in the dragons. Like, they weren't all just recuts of, of the Game of Thrones dragons, like Drogon, Rhaegal, and Viserion. I was kind of sad about this at first because that is one of the greatest designs of any dragon ever. The Dr Drogon look is one of my favorite fantastical creatures. But it shows diversity in the clade of dragons, or the evolutionary group of dragons in this world. Uh, Cyrax uh, has this kind of like camel horse-shaped face, and then Meles with the crown of horns and head ornamentation, and not to mention Drogon and, and the skull of Valyrian have this very Tyrannosaur-like look uh, in, in their skull shape. And I just, I really, really like that diversity in the same way that like modern groups of animals, like a modern antelope, modern canids, modern felines, they all look like calf, they all look like antelope, they all look like dogs, but of course they're, they're different from one another. And that was a really, really nice touch from, from House of the Dragon. Are you saying that I have to find yet another giant pterosaur and this time name it after one of the ones from House of the Dragon? Yes. Okay. <laughs> that would be super cool. Anybody, any thoughts on the direwolves? Okay, as the direwolf paleontologist on this panel, I think I have to speak about the <laughs> Yeah, that's all you. <laughs> right. so, yeah, so direwolves, um, well, first of all, they're actually not, uh, so Game of Thrones came out, and then soon after Game of Thrones, like the TV show came out, you know, all years of it, 
Um, like in the last couple years or so, there was a study that came out that using you know ancient DNA that uh, showed that direwolves actually are not. Okay, so backtrack. Game of Thrones direwolves look like gray wolves, but super sized, right? I mean, they used real dogs, um, just a large breed. Well, um, there is huge convergent evolution um, between direwolves and gray wolves. And it turns out that gray or dire wolves actually are not closely related to gray wolves as we thought in, you know, for the last hundred years. Um, so we thought that um, they were, you know, sister species in the past. Uh, so we thought that, so Canis, that's the genus name that was historically used for dire wolf and gray wolf. Uh, and that, so the, they, them having the same genus name suggests that they were sister species. However, we found out, or not we, people, society as a whole found out that uh, dire wolves actually diverged from gray wolves as far back as like, you know, five million years ago, which is pretty a pretty long time, younger than, you know, dinosaurs. So this is, eight, or this is a recent history. Um, but yeah, basically what I'm trying to say here is that, um, you know, based on their skeletons, I think I would still say that the dire wolves in Game of Thrones are a bit big, but they probably still looked kind of like wolves. But you know, the fact that dire wolves and gray wolves are not actually closely related to each other opens up some other possibilities for what dire wolves could have looked like. All right, so I think we're having more fun than the other. <laughs> I'm just gonna say it. This is where more fun. I don't know. Well, I, I, I mean, they're, 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 clearly they are very excited about the Dharma <laughs> <laughs> I think that's it. As soon as we got like to school day or something. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody by that punch bowl. <laughs> very awkwardly looking each other. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so we're going to go ahead and move on to our next movie, yes. um, Avatar. <laughs> what about you, Kristen? <laughs> All right, so. Um, when it comes to Avatar, um, using life on Earth to inspire alien life, uh, what are your thoughts on that? And marine life in Avatar, Kirsten, looking at you. Um, and how to make how do you make fantasy creatures more believe, believable using paleontology? Okay. Well, I will I will speak on the marine life part because I, I have a really neat thing to say about it to kind of convey. So. Obviously, the alien life is on the moon of Pandora, and Pandora is this beautiful, lush planet with diverse ecosystems. If you actually look at Pandora, like a zoom out version, Pandora has ice caps on it, oceans, uh, forests, plains, that we saw a little bit in the first movie. So it's actually a really, really well done planet that contrasts with, for example, the panel yesterday, if any of you were there, on kind of the monotone, basic one environment planets of a lot of sci-fi franchises, which is what I deeply appreciate. Um, Pandora. Now with regards to the marine life, which we're all going to see very soon uh, when the way water comes out in, in two weeks, a week and a half, is that water on Earth, water on another planet, is going to have the same physics constraints. We infer that the physics that we know of are the physics that control the entire universe. Then animals that live in water on another planet are going to probably be very similar to animals that live in water on Earth. Um, you need to locomote in this thick fluid, and so you need to have large surface area appendages, you need to be flexible, you need to have physiology that's going to enable you to um, exist in the water, either metabolizing oxygen through the water, so some type of gill-like structure. If, and on Pandora, I'm not sure that it's oxygen, but surely they're breathing <clears throat> some type of gas that powers their basic functions. And so, and also the equivalent of lungs. And that's why in the trailer, for those of you who've seen, there's like that big whale alien. There's kind of these smaller plesiosaur-like aliens, which I'm so excited to see. Um, there's this flying garfish thing, which um, uh, one of my colleagues on Twitter, um, his name is Dr. Solomon David, he's a gar specialist. He called it Gar Force One. And it's <laughs> so good. And so I, I really love the, the convergent themes, the, the flippers, the, the tail fins. I, I really do believe that if we found alien vertebrate equivalents on another planet, that they're going to look strikingly similar to living swimming animals and fossil swimming animals that we have today. And clearly the people, the concept designers of Pandora, 
um, believe the same and took that into consideration. So, yay, go see Avatar. I can also uh, note here, and then this was a very, con and I do know some people that worked on this, so I can say this was a concerted effort to continue this. Um, they they took a page from paleontology and from evolutionary biology in understanding that that ancestry can have long-term effects. So, for example, we have four limbs. We, you know, most of our most of our group, what we call uh, you know land living vertebrates, they're called tetrapods, have four limbs. They might only walk on two. They might have secondarily lost lost them like snakes, but they have four. On Pandora, the idea is that they were hexapods. They had the ancestral state is six limbs, and so most of the organisms have six limbs, which means the aquatic animals have six flippers, because they're supposed to be secondarily aquatic, um, and therefore it looks like a plesiosaur or six flippers instead of four, for example, things like that. And that is very much an idea they got directly from paleontology, and specifically from, uh, in this case, from the work of people who, who studied the the transition back to water from land, which, for example, Kirsten Formosa happens to do. Thank you. Any other thoughts on this before we move on? So, sorry, I just wanted to add in, like, it's not some, like, you know the animal, the flying animal in the avatar? Like, they made the motto partly uh, in reference to pterosaurus, which is the flying reptile, but then there is a flying reptile, a pterosaur, actually found with similar features in, uh, as the Ikran in Avatar. So they named the pterosaur, like in real life, in the fossil, we found that they named that um, Ikran dragon. So it's like named after the, the Avatar uh, flying animal, yeah. It's a little bit of pop, a little bit of pop culture inspiring paleontology. Uh, I alluded to another one of those earlier. I actually named a pterosaur uh, in reference to Game of Thrones uh, a couple of years ago as well. So it does happen. Yes, that's amazing. All right. Any other thoughts before? Oh, it's, oh yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's one of the the, the giant pterosaurs, Cryodracon boreas, frozen dragon of the north winds. Um, <laughs> So yes, that is a reference, of course, to the Syrian and the Risen. <laughs> All right. Any other thoughts? So we've talked a lot about how um, paleontology influences and inspires pop culture. But what about your thoughts on how pop culture um, influences paleontology? So for example, um, we have Historic Planet, right? Um, and we have that uh, voiced over by Attenborough. Um, who most of us know, right? Um, it, but it was funded by, um, you know, Favreau, um, who uh, does Star Wars and um, does MCU, things like that. So, uh, any thoughts on how um, pop culture influences paleontology? Well, I, so, th three things. Uh, the first is how many paleontologists in pop culture can inspire to get into the field to begin with. So, um, I know a lot of us here named our favorite movies previously. I'm not saying I wouldn't have been a paleontologist but it's, if, if I didn't see this media, but it really is influential and you hold on to it for a long time. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, and Nate can speak about this, the, name, the names of animals, what about Meraxes? If you want to yeah, ping, uh, plug that. So yeah, the way it inspires people, the uh, naming of things, because we're fans too. I mean, we love this stuff. So I, I think it's definitely a, a mutual give and take um, and, and that's really, really nice. Yeah, we, uh, we named uh, a new dinosaur a little earlier in the year, Meraxes, uh, one of these giant carcarodontosaurus from Argentina. Uh, our lead author, my buddy Juan, is a huge fan of the Game of Thrones series. So we wanted to throw that in there, and that's sort of a good example. And, I, and Kirsten's right, I mean, it, it has generated a lot more interest in our field. Um, you know, the number of people that Jurassic Park inspired and continues to inspire, it's, and it's had staying power. Like, I, I was at the Naval Academy once, and a guy telling me there, like, oh, 1986, best recruiting year ever, right after Top Gun came out. You know? <laughs> but, you know, we're talking about a couple of decades where dinosaurs are still constantly in the mix in pop culture. So it's not, uh, you know, it's not kind of like the, the brief pirates craze that we had for a while, and we had pirate <laughs> exhibitions and things like that. Dinosaurs are, are here to stay now in pop culture. There's a, another angle in which it can sort of influence paleontology that I think might be a little bit less intuitive, but has happened recently. Uh, so, so two of the 
panelists here, Kirsten and myself, actually worked on Prehistoric Planet. And uh, we actually ended up working out some math uh, for some to relate to some of the motion, some of these extinct animals, in response to something that they asked about in the making of the show. So there was something where they actually had a problem that came up because they were trying to get the animation right. And us being scientists, our response to that was, well, let's make sure it's accurate, let's math the heck out of this. So we did. But that was actually driven by a question that arose because of a pop culture outlet, which I think is super cool. So that's, there's something where... And will be published forthcoming. Yes, <laughs> yeah, and it's actually going to make it its way into publication, so it'll actually be part of the published literature in the sciences, and it started with uh, the question that inspired us from working together on the show, which is super, super cool. Uh, Adam, do you have any thoughts on that? This uh, particular question? Um, yeah, I, I think that there was a time uh, many years ago when paleontology was sort of an obscure field, and in the early 90s when Jurassic Park came out, you know, it inspired so many of us. And I think in the early 2000s or so, like, you, you know, the premier society for vertebrate paleontologists across the world, like, doubled in size. And it was something that folks who had been members of the society for years had kind of noticed, and they call it the Jurassic Park bump. So it's the number of people that want to pursue paleontology as a career. So. It's true. I think I'm, I might be one of the only paleontologists that was not inspired by Jurassic Park. Um, I was just, yeah, I didn't like Jurassic Park until I be, after I became a paleontologist. So interesting. <laughs> All right. So thank you so much for your contributions to this panel today and uh, your thoughts on everything, everybody. It was fantastic. Um, so now we're going to go ahead and open it for questions and answers. Um, two questions. Two. So we have time for two questions. Um, so we can go ahead. I see two hands up. So we're going to go ahead and take these two hands. So why don't we go in the back over here? Hi. Um, I love this question. We get it all the time. It's like, where, where are we at in our kind of collector curve as paleontologists? Um, and the, the truth is, we're still kind of in the exponential stage, whether you're talking about dinosaurs or, or other groups. We still just know a fraction of what's out there. And as we measure it over time, we can tell that we're not plateauing. We're still adding new species and growing and growing. And so there's a lot more discovery to be made just in terms of adding new species, and not to mention all the other new discoveries that relate to paleontology. And briefly, I'll tell you, although I don't have a, a dog in this hunt, really, um, Brontosaurus has been re-erected now as a valid genus again. So Brontosaurus is back, baby. <laughs> <laughs> There's some people that will probably try and sink it again, but that's, that's another great example of how science works, right? It's not something we write down in an encyclopedia and it never changes over time. If we're doing science well, we're constantly challenging those things. And I'd like to add something to that. Also, I love Brontosaurus. Brontosaurus is probably my favorite dinosaur, and I'm not even a dinosaur paleontologist. So when, when the news came out, Brontosaurus is back. That, that made my day. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yes, to, um, I also want to do a little plug for museums. So Nate is at a museum, I'm at a museum, a bunch of us are. Uh, museums have a lot of undiscovered species. So it's not just, you know, we're not just discovering species when we go out there and collect in the field. A lot of the time, um, museums have already gone out and collected, right, and brought the specimens back there, fossil jackets, whatever. They are sitting in museums' collection spaces um, waiting for people to study them. And so, yeah, there's a lot of value for, um, for us here to discover. All right, unfortunately we don't have any time for any more questions because we're out of time now. But if you do have questions, um, we're gonna be hanging out at booth 549 and you can ask us questions um, how long they all wanna stay around and ask questions for. All right, so um, this, this panel was sponsored by the ALF Museum and Cosplay for Science. And please check us out on social media and uh, come visit our booth. Thank you. Thank you.